אני לא שמעתי על כך ואינני יודעת. ואני יודעת מדוע במלחמה מוכרחים לחדש ממשלות. I'm so sorry that I just didn't hear. Would you step forward and repeat your question, please? Yes. First of all, was the decision to wait for the Arabs a political decision? To wait for the Arabs? Oh, no preemptive uh, uh, act. Sell it. Yes. It was a political decision. It, uh, I don't think it has any um, relevancy to uh, what you say was the, peer, is the uh, Israel government's policy and uh, not to uh, sacrifice uh, lives for political decisions. Uh, during the war, uh, several times a day, various political decisions have to be taken. But uh, maybe some of them. In a war, my great sorrow, people lose lives. Sometimes you take one decision and you think maybe you can save lives in that way, and it turns around the other way. So there's no guarantee for political decisions whether they save lives or not. Um, what was the <coughs> last part? Of no. I, none whatsoever. I don't believe it at any rate. Yeah. I haven't heard any. Madam Prime Minister, is the immigration of Soviet Jews continuing? Um, would you mind if I don't answer this? Not at all. What do you think of the project of expansion mediation? French mediation? That's because France is very neutral, I suppose. <laughs> France has even overstepped the uh, claim for neutrality. No, we don't believe, uh, I want to make myself clear. Mediation that we were prepared to accept and will be ready to accept at any time <clears throat> is either an individual or a government that decides that its aid should be limited to one thing and one thing only, which is a very, very important step, and that is to help the parties get together. Uh, but therefore, it's uh, no arbitration and no mediator that thinks that he knows better than the parties know what is good for them. And, uh, and therefore, when this was attempted in the past, it failed. If it will be attempted in the future, it will fail. It's these two peoples whose sons met in battle over and over and over again. The governments of these people must meet at the negotiating table and not have somebody from far away who, uh, whose life and independence and sovereignty is not at stake. It's these people in this area that have everything to win and everything to lose. Therefore, it's these people that must do it. Nothing can save the leaders of the Arab countries from taking this responsibility 
for the fate of their people in their own hands and not to build ideas and castles in the air. Some day Brezhnev can save them, the next day President Nixon before elections or President Nixon after elections, before the summit meeting, after the summit meeting, all these are gimmicks that did not work in the past, will not work in the future. President Sadat, President Assad, King Hussein, and all the others must have the courage. Why do they have so much courage to send their men to war? Why haven't they the courage to meet us at a negotiating table? If uh, we don't, uh, they're not satisfied, they can always get up from the table and leave. But not even to try to sit down with us in order to come to <clears throat> a peace tr <clears throat> treaty which will end all wars. That courage they are lacking. That somebody must do for them. Therefore, not France nor any other country can do that for them, should not take it upon themselves to do for them. Every country, every government that encourages them not to meet us at negotiating table, everybody that um, encourages them in their um, intransigence and in their hopes that somebody somehow will solve their problems for them, I think is doing a disservice not only to Israel, but to the Arabs and to peace. Gentlemen in the back. <clears throat> Prime Minister, do I detect a slightly different tone in your remarks about the events on the southern front? Does Israel categorically rule out a ceasefire which includes Egyptian troops on the side of the Gaza? I don't know what tone you've heard before. But what I said is when we hear a suggestion by, uh, for a, peace, a ceasefire, the government of Israel, believe me, very seriously and with great responsibility for everything that is concerned, will sit down and deal with it. So far, I don't hear anything about our neighbors being prepared for ceasefire. So, uh, look, uh, we have so many problems on our hands that we do not want to, to think up problems. When ceasefire will be a reality, a suggestion for ceasefire will be a reality, believe me, the government of Israel will not lose many minutes before it will be in session and will deal with this problem. Yes, no, no, gentlemen. Prime Minister, uh, would you pre uh, be prepared that the Israeli government uh, agrees to return territories seized in 67 for the price of stopping the bloodshed and, uh, and peace. That every price, any price. From that, one would uh, almost come to the con The question was for the price of peace and stopping the bloodshed, would we be prepared to give up? the uh, territories that we occupied in the war that was forced upon us, that I'm adding my own, in 67. Uh, somebody coming into this room that uh, comes from another planet would think that in 67, Israel went to war, forced a war upon its neighbors in order to take the Sinai Desert, the Western Bank, and uh, the Golan Heights. But okay. since but since we're all here from the same planet, and uh, we've not only, you write newspapers, we also read newspapers. So this wasn't exactly the description of what happened in 67. And when Israel refused to go back to the borders of 67, because these borders were washed away in blood, exactly as the 47 borders were washed away in blood by attack by our neighbors. Exactly as now, as the, in 67, they washed away the, um, the lines in Syria and Jordan and the others. And now they've washed away borders, and I don't know what will happen after this. So we, our neighbors cannot take a walk of this kind with tens of thousands of men, with thousands of tanks, with bombers, kill, destroy, 
and then say, well, all right, we didn't do it this time, we'll try it again next time, but please give us borders that will be easier for us to cross. So good we are not. <laughs> I believe that the United States and the policy that is adopted at any rate for the last uh, two or three years, saying that the United States is prepared to give its services to help the parties to get together and find a solution for the problem. The United States was prepared to aid the parties to get together on the Suez um, arrangement I think the United States has done, probably is doing also at this moment, everything that is possible to do except one thing which I think is impossible and uh, God bless the United States that it doesn't do it. To force or to try to force a solution upon any one of the parties. And uh, therefore I think the United States has uh, certainly done everything for peace. No, 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 wait a minute, this is the second hour already, I'm sorry. Talk Many more. Uh, no, I don't wish to comment on it, but I'm sure that uh, it won't take very long and uh, the figures will be known. I want to tell you one thing. To us, the other day on the Israeli television, I was asked by Mr. Nissan, what is the price for the victory that you're talking about? I said, I don't know. To me, one man dead is a terrible price. This man has a mother, a father, a wife, sisters, brothers, maybe children. And if Sadat, and I'm not ashamed to stand here before you, a prime minister, that if you wish, emotional, if you wish, sentimental, with all my heart, for the sake of the Egyptian people, I wish that Sadat would become emotional and sentimental over one dead man. When that moment comes, there is peace automatically. So there will be more than one man. And uh, it's a terrible price for nothing. Just uh, to satisfy ambitions of leaders that have no hearts. But, uh, and may I say one more thing here? I spoke before about the aid of the Soviet Union to uh, Syria, Egypt, and Iraq. As bad and as dangerous as it is for Israel, if I at least believe for one single moment that this aid that the Soviet Union is giving to the Arab countries is because of the love for the Arab people, I would say, well, it's too bad. They don't like the Jews, but they like the Arabs. But that isn't true. It's for callous interests of the Soviet Union. Therefore, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of Egyptians and Syrians can be killed and numbers of Israelis can be killed and they don't care. That's the most terrible aspect of the entire situation. Mr. Zigerman. It has been said that the Syrians and the Egyptians are fighting this time with a high morale and better and are unreasonable because they are fighting to get back territories which was theirs before 67. Is this correct? <coughs> This is, uh, I'll, I'll repeat the question first place, the uh, question was, it is said that the Egyptian and Syrian uh, soldiers are fighting uh, better this time than they did before because they are fighting to get back their territories. First place, one has to prove that it's 